Thank you for attending. This is Xi Yi from the University Network. And my co-host is Mr. Richard Advani from Supreme Lending, a, uh, one of the nation's leading uh, mortgage lending firm. He does financing for real investors all over the country, 50 states, one to four units. And he also helped uh, owner occupy uh, buyers to, to get the financing as well. So uh, thank you for attending Richard and I appreciate your time. And today's topic, we can talk about 1031 tax deferred exchange. Now, some of you, uh, again, we're not tax advisors. So this is a, our disclaimer. We just give you some education, right? Because everybody's situation is different. You need to consult with your own licensed financial advisors to go over your unique situations so you can make informed decisions uh, about any financial, uh, financial uh, matters, real estate included. So with that said, <clears throat> the reason why we are, Richard and I pick, have picked this topic because we work together for a number of years and we help real estate investors to buy out-of-state investment properties. So one of the extra strategies that investors have is uh, as their investment property grow over time, that's great, they're making good money. So that's all about wealth building. Uh, there are many extra strategies associated with uh, real estate investment properties. And one of them is a uh, 1031 tax deferred exchange. This means if one were to sell an investment property, if they, they uh, the, and the property have earned a profit, that means the selling price is greater than their debt. Then you, you're gonna be subject to a capital gains tax. I don't know the tax bracket. Uh, again, I'm not a licensed tax advisor. So, so you could, you could, you could trigger a tax event so uh, if you sell your investment property, you gain a profit out of it. If you do not do anything else, you just want to pocket the money. Yeah, you have to pay you know, federal tax, yeah, capital gains tax, so, uh, and even state uh, taxes. Uh, now, one way to, uh, uh, to overcome that, uh, some investors, they want to leverage their wealth. They want to have a long-term wealth building for, uh, portfolio. They want to use the leverage the properties to keep growing by more investment properties so it can so they can achieve whatever is their definition of financial freedom so <clears throat> so uh, one of the strategies that uh, many investors have, uh, have done previously is to do a 1031 tax free exchange because if they that means if they sell the investment property uh, uh, for profit and within 45 days they have to identify replacement investment properties and then six months they have to close escrow on the replacement property within 180 days which is six months so uh, and, and if, if they can do this kind of strategies then their capital gains are deferred they do not have to pay capital gains right so uh you know uh tender in exchange people investors they they sell the properties uh they do 1031 they leverage into multiple properties out of state or somewhere somewhere else uh then they continue to uh to create wealth equity building for many many years to come now uh, before richard uh, we have uh, richard especially myself included and our network we have experienced a lot of california investors over the past uh six seven years i suppose that their california properties have grown so much but they're getting so little cash flow from the California rentals, they uh they did 1031 out of state. They buying one property to replace that with 10 out of state, much cheaper cash flow homes. But now you know what we're seeing, Richard. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm trying to say, really. <laughs> but I, I always love to surprise you. I love this spontaneous presentation that we've been doing. Uh, that's that's in real time. So uh, we're not talking about California investors doing 1031, uh, 1031 out of state. We talked about that before many times. And I would say most of the California investors, they already concluded uh, their 1031 from California to out of state. Uh, I'm sure you agree. Now, there's another uh, kind of strategy that doing 10, 1031. The investors, our investors, not just ours, any investors from any part of the country, they have purchased investment properties in the last two, three, four, five years in those hot markets, doesn't matter. It could be Phoenix, Arizona, Nevada, could be in Boise, Idaho, it could be in Austin, Texas, could be in Raleigh, North Carolina, it could be 
and in Central Florida, could be in Southwest Florida, Cape Coral, could be uh, in Austin, Texas, of course, San Antonio. But let, let me give some examples. So, okay, I can only speak, let's go over case study of our investors and that which uh, Avani has helped with the financing a few years ago. People, our investors that bought, let me give you one example. Let's say Austin, Texas. Uh, let's use that case study. Our investors have bought a, a new building uh, property, single family homes, like three or four or five years ago, even two years ago in Austin, Texas, for like $150,000 to $200,000. Almost brand new home, single family home, 1,500 square foot in Austin and outside Austin. Like 200K they bought two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. Now, today, they're like 400,000 even 450,000, their houses have increased by 50 to 100%. That's one example. The other example, we have uh, our investors bought in Raleigh, North Carolina, and even in Central Florida, uh, we have similar ex experiences where our investors in Southwest uh, Florida, Cape Coral as well, they bought like two, three, four years ago, th those investment homes were at that time were like 150K. Now they are $350,000. So I'm, I'm beginning to see some of our investors uh, from those markets, they're doing 1031 exchange into other markets because they, they have gained so much equity. Not only that, Richard, I want you to cover one more thing. Not only 1031, that's only one strategy. Some of my investors, they do not want to sell but they will still want to leverage more because they have gained so much equity in the past couple of years, especially during the pandemic. What if some of my investors, would, the multiple homes they bought, some of my investors have bought five, 10 homes, you know, Richard have done those loans for, uh, for them. Now, some of them, they don't want to do 1031. They want to do a cash out refinance of their rental property equity to leverage, to buy more rental property somewhere else in the US or maybe in the Midwest for high cash flow properties. I don't know, maybe uh, multi-units that they want to do it. So Richard, uh, since you are, you're such an important person, <laughs> as a loan agent, you know how to help investors in this situation to strategize. Should they do a 1031? Should they do a cash out refinance of their, uh, of their, uh, of their investment properties I'm talking about? So if so, I know each case is different, Look at the uh, loan to value scenario. Uh, as a as a you as a loan agent, you look at the lending. You look at underwriter. What are the you know numerical requirement like debt to income ratio, uh, DTI, uh, you know loan to value. What numerically, what can how can investors go over this strategy when they when they consult with you, so they can leverage more, buy more properties using these two strategies. Go ahead. I'm sorry for the long. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I guess it really depends from investor to investor. I am a fan of having my cake and eating it too. So if you have the opportunity to cash out of a property, gain some additional equity, that way you can use that to redeploy and purchase more property while still retaining the original asset. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Um, most people, obviously 1031, um, because there's a significant amount of appreciation in the property um, or also because they want to capture all of that equity. Now, keep in mind with the cash out refinance, generally we can loan up to about 75% of the home's value. So, um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is 10, with the 1031 exchange, although it defers and prevents you from paying a bunch of taxes on the capital gains, uh, generally they have fees themselves, right? They're going to have uh, their own processing fees and so forth. So a lot of times for a property that, you know, maybe you can 1031 and have 50 to $60,000 in proceeds. Um, oftentimes the numbers actually pencil out the same, similar, or even better with uh, retaining that property, doing a cash out refinance, because you are going to mitigate some of those costs that you will experience with the 1031 exchange. So, I mean, basically when someone comes in uh, with a scenario of having a good amount of equity and kind of wanting to redeploy some of that equity, what we'll do is analyze, obviously, 
how much equity they have, um, and then how much they would net with um, a 1031 versus a cash out transaction. Let's do one, uh, sorry, let's do one case study. Let me give you an example. Uh, an investor, this is, actually, this is an actual case. It happened quite often with our investors. So sorry to interrupt you, uh, just to, along, along the line, what you're just saying, uh, my, my investors bought it for 200K three years ago in Austin, for example, and they did a 20% down payment. So the loan amount, let's say 150,000. Now the property have increased to 400,000. So $400,000 market value versus the loan balance of 150. With that number, when the cash out refinance, walk, walk us through the refinance scenario. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, on a property that's appreciated to 400,000, assuming it's a single family home, we can take it to about 75% loan to value, which okay. would mean a, a loan of about $300,000. Now, in the example you gave, you know, the individual has a loan probably of 150,000 or a little lower. So right. in this example, you can pull 150,000 cash out and then use that to redeploy into two to three additional properties. And it allows you to still obviously retain that original asset and rental. And the cool thing too, is with rents increasing now, as you mentioned, you know, rent inflation really catching up, um, you still, you should have a good amount of room to increase that loan amount, pull the cash out and still leave your cash flow position similar to what it is today. You know, still be able to break even or make uh, a little cash flow on that property. So let's, look, let's do the calculation. $400,000 value multiplied by 70% loan to value. Is that what you said? 75%. Yeah. So what is it? What's 400,000? Let me, let me do a calculation. 400,000. What is, uh, hold on. It's 300,000. Okay, 300,000 on cash on refinance. Yeah, so what investors want to buy a cheaper home somewhere in Alabama or, or in the Midwest somewhere or in my market in Buffalo and Iowa Falls with 150 grand, uh, they could buy four, five, six more investment property that can cash flow, right? That's, uh, that's one of the strategy, right? Ch buy cheaper properties, buy more property, more cash flow, diversification, geographic diversification, asset type investment uh, diversification, those kind of things. So, the, so what you're saying is the cost of borrowing the 150 grand from that particular rental property uh, uh, creates the higher payment. What I hear you saying is that higher payment should not be that uh, significant because the, because of the higher rent uh, on that subject property should be a wash, should be a, like a, make that house be a, a break even situation maybe perhaps, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, neither C Wing or I recommend taking out so much cash so that the property is now a negative, right? The goal is to pull out as much as you can to not jeopardize that investment and then, you know, redeploy those proceeds into new investments. Exactly. The, uh, what's, what is the interest rate on the refinance on the rental property, um, at least right now? Uh, generally in the high 4% range. Okay, okay. still not bad. 30% amortized fixed rate mortgage as well, right? Correct. Okay, good. So, so what I hear saying is that uh, when a person is reaching 70% loan to value or less, an uh, investor, you know, could do a cash out refinance to uh, buy more properties in different markets for more cash flow properties, hopefully, or they can do a 1031 tax for exchange. Some still want to do a 1031 tax for exchange because they, you know, that's a lot of reasons they want to do that, but that's still a viable scenario. And the, uh, to conclude this presentation for a couple of more minutes, the other exit strategies an investor have that have, uh, those that have built up like five to 10 out of state rental properties, based on my experience or monitoring my, our investors. The other extra strategies, other than the two strategies we spoke about, uh, because of the five to 10 property portfolio they have accumulated, they could use all the cash flow uh, from each property and, uh, and focus on one property at a time and use the cumulative monthly cash flow to accelerate one property at a time to pay down the mortgage. So if, if, if a person have 10 properties uh, and each property cash flow like $300 out of state, 
10 times three is 3,000. If that, in, if that investor are not ready to retire, right? Maybe if they have a retirement horizon is 10, 20 years away, what are you gonna do with the cash flow? Spend the cash flow? No. One exit strategy is use that $3,000 of net monthly cash flow from those 10 properties and accelerate and pay the extra principal of, of a, one of the properties. And if they, could, if they could pay one extra principal per month, that debt on one mortgage on that one rental property can be reduced by do a principal pay down acceleration once per month, that 30 year mortgage can be paid off in about five years. Does that, does that make sense? Do you agree with the high level conceptual math I just provided? Yep. Then furthermore, uh, if that investor, so the one in the investment property, one loan, uh, $100,000, $150,000 has been paid off in a mere five years, then you apply uh, additional cash flow from that house that no longer have a mortgage, apply the cash flow from that property and add more cash flow beyond $3,000 that investors already have and use the same domino effect. Identify another rental property with a mortgage, okay, and apply the $3,300 monthly passive income into extra principal pay down on the 30 year mortgage of another debt, another rental property, and pay it off in about three years, pay it off the 30 year debt in three years. If you use the same domino effect, that 10 property scenario, you can all could be paid off in about 10 to 15 years using the cash flow. You know, you otherwise you wouldn't use anyway because our investor horizon is so far down the road, right? And then by the end of 10 to 15 years, those 10 uh, investment properties that you that investor initially used to 20% down payment will be debt-free, no mortgages. Then the three to four to five hundred dollars per per, uh, per cash flow uh, are free and clear. I mean, you can add on whatever without any kind of monthly mortgage on those rental properties your passive income will be increased significantly. So someone can retire with seven to $10,000 on net monthly passive income for the 10 properties. And you're not even touching any of the, uh, the uh, equity of, the, of each of the rental houses. You can retire just off the passive income without any debt. All the 10 mortgages has already been paid for. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I haven't heard that strategy mentioned a lot, but I definitely like it because, as you said, you know, you could focus on one property at a time, get that paid off, move on to the next one. And then by the time you retire, obviously, you strategically have a bunch of paid off properties. And it gives you a little more flexibility in terms of planning and stuff, too, when you have, you know, a couple paid off properties versus, you know, all of them at 40% loan to value, there is uh, definitely benefit to having some paid off. So that's a cool strategy. I like it. Yeah. And then one more, one more exit strategy is uh, some investors, they don't want to do anything. They don't want to do a 1031. They don't want to cash out refinance. They don't want to pay it down. Maybe when, when at the end of the road, 10, 20 years later, when an investor with this 10 property portfolio, uh, they can retire. It's okay. Nothing wrong with selling the all 10 properties and still pay the capital gains. Who cares? They still pocket a lot of money, net even after the capital gains, uh, because 20 years from now, who knows how much each of the property is valued. So uh, they got plenty of money to live even after paying off the taxes. So there are many, many extra strategies, uh, is, uh, but they all are very enticing. Each person's investor's goals are different. So I, you know, I challenge everyone, when, when every uh, investor of buying their first rental property or more, they have to kind of think long-term. What is their retirement strategy? What is their exit strategy, if you will, right? So uh, that's the fun part, right? And um, just investors go through the journey, invest for the long-term, you know, ignore all the chatter, ignore all the negativity, the doom and gloom, the negative news media, you know, all the YouTube videos of people talking crash and this and that uh, for clickbait, whatever. <laughs> so focus on your personal economy, uh, just overcome any short-term situations, invest for the long-term, be patient and go through the journey and uh, don't panic, stay the course, 
And, uh, and that's how you achieve financial freedom. Uh, whether you're doing real estate or not, it doesn't matter in any kind of wealth building strategies. You know, you got to stay the course. You got to overcome uh, long term. So that's my uh, uh, summary. Any last minute uh, recap from you about this? No, I think you pretty much covered everything. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And hopefully uh, you'll receive a lot of value from this. Thank you so much. This is Siren Yi and my uh, guest speaker, Mr. Richard Avani. Thank you for attending.